Developed by WayForward Technology and published by Majesco, Double Dragon Neon is a 2012 game released for PS3, Xbox 360, Nintendo Switch, and later brought to the PC by Abstraction Games, perhaps better known for their involvement with the Hotline Miami series. The PC version is the one we're looking at today, though the versions appear to be more or less the same. Let's start off with the first thing you'll see, the graphics. The game is in a very cartoony style. By the power of the dragon! No, not that cartoon. It looks pretty good, though the more comedic and cartoonish characters make the game feel less like the more gritty feel found in the earlier entries. That being said, I grew to enjoy the style, especially the backgrounds. The character models look okay, though some, like a Bobo, don't really capture the menace found in earlier games in the series. There's a distinct lack of variations in the enemies though, and which we'll cover later. It didn't really feel like this game looked very great, even for the time it was released, which is a far cry from the NES days, where Double Dragon had some of the most memorable graphics and characters on the system. Sound, however, is great, the characters make it plenty of chatter, and the music not only having remixes of the classic tunes, but also some killer original tunes, all done by the chiptune artist Vert. Really, the tracks here are awesome, and you'll have some of them stuck in your head for weeks. Moving on to plot, this one has little or nothing to do with previous entries. Sure, some of the old hands are back at it, but they have a completely new leader, the levels take you into space in a biomechanical laboratory, and there aren't really any traces of the old post-apocalyptic setting anywhere besides possibly the last level. You're hunting down the goons who took Marion once again, but the plot is pretty lazy, and, when compared to the older games in the series, comes a little bit short. The game has done somewhat of a parody, so I wasn't expecting much, but this is a game you'd be playing for upwards of 10 hours if you want to 100% the damn thing, and this lack of plot is exacerbated by points we'll cover next in presentation. Presentation is pretty standard, and really the game lacks a lot of depth. Your basic moveset features the punch, this kick which will go into a spin kick if you connect three times, throws, ground attacks, sweeps, and two jump kicks each with different uses. You can also use the knee attack from Double Dragon 2, though it's less powerful. Weapons can be obtained, and their longevity is determined by a skill which you can improve. There are 10 levels, 2 levels on the streets, 2 taking place in the Rocket Dojo, 2 in the countryside back on Earth, 2 in the laboratory, and then the Haunted Forest and the Neon Fortress. You'll be seeing these levels a ton, especially as you power up your character and you have to revisit shops or tape smiths. Tape smiths? Yeah, smithies for your tapes! Why tapes? Well, the game is really trying hard to capture that 80s vibe, so they give you various power-ups and moves via tapes. These are divided into two general categories, attacks and buffs. The attacks vary from a devastating close-range punch to the iconic spin kick to throwing fireballs to an old-school screen-clearing attack, with more than I mentioned to try out and to see what works for you. I chose the spin kick most of the time, as I had the most use for me. The buffs range from stat boosts, one for an offense-oriented style, one for more durability, one that allows you to absorb health or make the weapons last longer. I tended to use training wheels, which increased my health and defense, or power gambit, which made it far easier to kill enemies, but the amount of stances as they are called will allow a player to pick a few and see what they like. Overall, there are 10 different types of each tape, and you can equip one attack and one buff, so you're free to experiment until you find the perfect mix. To level up these tapes, you have to clear levels and defeat the bosses. Enemies drop power-ups such as magic recharges or tapes, or money for the shops, which sell tapes and extra lives. You can increase the max power of each tape at the tape smith. But who are these enemies? Familiar faces such as the acrobatic goon Williams or the sadistic seductress Linda are back, along with a slightly dopey looking Abobo. Joining them are mystical geishas, serious shinobi, killer drones, the undead, and evil sorcerers. They are led by the evil Skullmageddon, who is self-described as... His henchmen's rage from robotic psychopaths, mutant plants, to clones of the Lee brothers themselves. One boss is a giant tank reminiscent of a boss from Double Dragon 2. The bosses can be challenging, but all have patterns that can be learned, and since you'll be farming them a lot to gain Mithril to upgrade your tapes, it will all start to become a bit boring after a while. The gameplay feels less like previous games, and more like Turtles in Time or Streets of Rage. Platforming is very rare, but since falling doesn't cause instant death, it's less of an annoyance. The game does drag on, pardon the pun, as you'll need to complete the game three times to beat each difficulty. You'll need to grind in order to power up your tapes, get more tapes, get more mithril to power up your tapes, then rinse and repeat. I spent about 11 hours on this game, which is far more than a beat-em-up of this depth really needs to be played. Yeah, the gameplay is fluid and pretty fun, the graphics passable, the sound great, but games of this genre always suffered a lot from replayability issues forcing me to farm and replay the same couple levels over and over, since only a few levels have tape smiths or shops, you'll be visiting a lot of these levels a lot, and that doesn't really help the game feel any more replayable than it would if you just beat it one time. So do I recommend this game? 
Diehard fans of the series may enjoy this for the nod to the classics. They will probably feel put off by the rest of the package, though. Newer gamers may find this game more recognizable, but there isn't much compelling them to stay for the entire ride. I definitely wouldn't recommend this game to beginners of the Double Dragon series. I guess it appeals mostly to retro gamers who want a game with a classic beat-em-up vibe, but I personally just recommend beating this on the regular difficulty and then moving on.